Yes, this year. Especially this year. This year, more than ever. Not because it wasn't so bad. Not because next year will be better. Not because some good things happened. Not even just because God says so. Rejoice in the Lord, you people of the Lord, because Christ is Lord. This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the year of God's grace, again. We are still the redeemed, still ransomed by the blood, still furiously convinced, especially this year, that neither life, nor death, nor pandemic, nor lockdown, nor masks, nor isolation, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We will give thanks this year, not in spite of what was lost, but because of what cannot be. We'll rejoice in the Lord because we are the people of the Lord. Let's do more than count our blessings. Let's count ourselves among the blessed. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Good morning, La Jolla Presbyterian Church and friends. It's uh, great to be with you as we gather again online to worship our living God. It's Thanksgiving week, and typically a lot of us are traveling and uh, expectations of being with family and friends, and that's probably going to look a little bit different for many of us. Uh, but the good news is that God is still with us, that God is a God of hope and God is a God of expectation, and, and God promises to be with us. I love how Psalm 95 begins. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God with thanksgiving and extol God with music and song. This day, we come before God with thanksgiving. We come expectantly. We come waiting to hear what God might say to us, whether through the spoken word, whether through the written word, whether through song or through prayer. The promise is that God is with us that God loves us, that God delights in us. We're talking this morning about the blessing that God gives to us, that we, we are inheritors. We, we inherit that blessing that God places upon us, telling us that we are loved, that we belong, that we are his. And so we gather to worship that living God. I invite you now to join with me in prayer. God, thanks for this day that you have given to us, a chance to rejoice in you, the chance to once again be reminded of the promise that you are with us. So God, would you comfort those who need comfort? We encourage those who need to be encouraged. Would you stand beside those who just need someone to be near them? And God, would you give us all that renewed sense of your joy and your peace? We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. We want to welcome you this morning to our online worship service. We invite you to worship with us as we sing praises to our Lord.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. It is a way. It is a way. 
Good morning, church. I'm Cynthia, our director of women's ministry. I want to welcome you to church online today. I pray the riches of God's blessings over all of you. On behalf of the church, I want to thank you for your continued donations. Your tithes and offerings continue to fuel the work of this church, and we are so grateful. We have a new stewardship brochure available. Look for it in the mail or in our weekly email. Next Sunday, November 29th, we are introducing a brand new Christmas event the LJPC Advent Art Walk. Come experience the wonder of the season through a 25 minute walkthrough of the life of Christ as told through scripture and 12 art stations. Artists from the LJPC Art Guild and children from our congregation have prepared art pieces at each of the 12 stops. Arrive on Draper Avenue anytime between 5 to 8 p.m. and bring your own phone and earphones so you can tune into the audio story that guides the walk. Bring kids and grandkids, as this is an all-church event. Invite your neighbors. Come experience the full story of Jesus as we prepare our hearts to celebrate Christmas. One of the wonderful things about the Christmas season is that it presents us with great opportunities to give to others. Our Mission Partners gift catalog is available now. You can find it online or check the weekly email. You'll find ways you can give or gifts you can give on behalf of others. Another way you can give is through the mobile blood drive on December 6th from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Sign up at ljpress.org slash blood to attend. The Christmas season will be different than any past ones, and it brings up a lot of emotions. For those of you who have lost a loved one recently, we invite you to our blue Christmas service on December 4th at 3 p.m. led by Pastor Scott. Please RSVP to the church office if you would like to attend. And ladies, if you're interested in joining the Women's Bible Study, I teach on Wednesday mornings at 9.15. Next week on December 2nd would be a great time to jump in. We have finished Romans and we'll be returning to the end of Acts and then reading the prison epistles after that. You can jump in now and won't feel left behind. We are in person and simultaneous live Zoom. As we prepare our hearts to hear the word of God, let's pray. Father, a lot of us are experiencing a sense of mourning and loss right now. Many of us have changed plans for Thanksgiving and are grieving the loss of being with family or loved ones this week. Some of us don't have kids coming home who usually do. We had hoped a vaccine would be out and things would be different by now. Jesus, you know the sadness in many of our hearts right now, and I pray that we would experience your powerful comfort in this moment, right now. Jesus, you are enough for us. Help us to experience contentment and peace from your Holy Spirit in our hearts right now. Help us to find joy, to choose joy, and to look for ways that we can bring joy to others. We see a lot of sadness and some hopelessness around us. Empower us by your Spirit to represent your hope to others. As we open up your word right now, help us to turn our awareness towards you. Help us to clear our minds and to be present. Grant us your wisdom and knowledge through the power of your Holy Spirit, to understand your word and to apply it to our lives. Speak to each of us individually. Change us and how we need to be changed. Humble us where we need to be humbled. Forgive us for our own pride and self-centeredness. Heal us where we need to be healed. Help us to walk in victory through the power of your spirit. And through studying your word, help us to be continually made more like Jesus, be transformed from glory to glory. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, friends. 
I want to show you a picture. Isn't it beautiful? This is a place in the Middle East where Jesus lived. The Jordan River flows into it and fills it, but there isn't any place for the water to run out. Now that might not seem like a big deal, but because the water coming in is salty, the salt gets so strong that fish and plants can't even live in it. In fact, do you know what they call it? The Dead Sea. If there was a place for the water to flow out, the problem would be solved. Water would come in and circulate and then move downstream to other areas, carrying life-giving water. As it is, the salt overwhelms everything and no life can survive. You know, the Dead Sea reminds me of what can happen to us when blessings pour into us, but there's no outlet. You see, when God blesses us with time, money, talent, love, food, shelter, education, and so much more, we have the choice to keep it all for ourselves or to share it with others. Now, when we keep it all for ourselves, we become like the Dead Sea. We might look pretty on the outside, but we're stagnant and lifeless inside. Jesus referred to himself as the living water. And in the book of John, chapter 7, verse 38, we see that he says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within them. When we believe in Jesus, we want to have his life flowing through us. So how does that work? Well, we look at every blessing that has been, God has poured into us, and after we thank him, we ask him, what would you like me to do with this? Sometimes you'll keep it all for yourself. Sometimes you'll give it away completely. And other times you might just share a part of it. When we are grateful for our blessings and choose to use them to bless others, we become like a river of living water. And I don't know about you, but I'd much rather be a living river than a dead sea. Will you pray with me? Dear God, you are the giver of all good gifts, and we are so grateful. Lord, would you remind us that these gifts are all from you to be used for your purpose and give us a willing and cheerful heart when we use them to help others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we mentioned a week ago, we are spending this week talking about the idea of a blessing. And then the following Sunday, we will move into the season of Advent. I want to ask you to be looking uh, for a mailing that's coming out this week that we're sending Advent devotionals out and would love to have you just follow along with those. It's a great way, a daily reading. We typically hand those out on Sunday morning. We're not really able to do that all that well. So those will be um, arriving in the mail during the week of Thanksgiving. So take a look at those. Uh, work through the season of Advent with us. So one of my favorite all-time Christmas movies is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Now, it is not the most holy of movies, and it is certainly uh, plenty irreverent. But I love Chevy Chase and the roles that he plays. The role that he plays in that movie is Clark Griswold. The family gathers for Christmas dinner, and they sit around the table. And Clark Griswold looks at Aunt Bethany and says, Aunt Bethany, in honor of your 80th birthday... We'd like for you to say grace. Now, Aunt Bethany is a little hard of hearing, and she also isn't quite totally there. And so she hears grace, and she says, grace, she died 30 years ago. And the response back, and her husband says to her, they want you to say grace. They want you to give the blessing. And so Aunt Bethany folds her hands, bows her head, and says, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And at that point, other people are chiming in and speaking it with her, and she says, she finishes up, and Clark says, Amen! Let's eat. Now, that really isn't the blessing that I'm looking for. It's the Pledge of Allegiance. And it doesn't quite fit 
with the blessing we expect at the Christmas dinner. But the reality is, is that sometimes things don't exactly fit. And this year perhaps has been kind of like that, that we expect a blessing, but it's, it's a little bit off. It's not quite right. So I want to talk today around this idea of blessing, and particularly as we think about Thanksgiving. And the blessing from the perspective that God's blessing for us, what, what that blessing looks like, what does it mean to be blessed by God? And that idea of God's blessing um, we see it early on in Scripture. Oftentimes we think of the blessing as kind of a benediction. Uh, the benediction bringing together two Latin words, bene, meaning good, uh, diction, which means speech or word. So it's a good word. But God's blessing is spoken early on in Scripture. We, we see this all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, when, when God is, is, is finishing up the creation. And he's speaking about humankind. And we read this, Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The idea of God's blessing, the concept that runs behind it, is that God basically says, I am with you and I am for you. It, it, it's kind of this twofold promise that, that he gives to us. It's saying, I delight in you. Like God looks around at his creation. He says, this is so good. I delight in this. But then he also gives this promise of saying, and I'm with you. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to hold you. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at the blessing that comes from the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. It's sometimes called the, the Aaronic blessing. It's the words that God gives to Moses, who gives to Aaron. And then Aaron and the priests bless the people with these words. This is, this is their benediction. It's, it's the last thing that they would hear as they went out into the world. And it's why we still give the blessing or the benediction to this day. So it's, this is Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face, his countenance toward you, and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. So this is the way in which God says, I want you to speak my words over the nation of Israel. The reality is this. We all long to be blessed. We all long for someone to speak words of hope and encouragement to us. It's interesting that one of the first stories that we read about in, in Genesis is around the story of one who was not blessed by his father. You may remember that, that the story of, of Isaac, and they have twins of Esau and Jacob. And Isaac loved Esau, and he blessed Esau, but he never spoke a word of blessing over Jacob. And so Jacob eventually gets to this place because he never heard the word of blessing where he tricks his father out of the blessing. And as a result of that, he has to flee. He has to flee from his brother Esau. He runs away from his family. He never sees his parents again. But all he wanted was his father's blessing. He wanted a word of hope and encouragement spoken over him that never came. We all long for words of blessing. And the great thing that Scripture teaches us, this, this blessing that comes out of number six, is that this is what God is all about. It begins with those words, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. 
we turn our attention to Psalm 121, we, we hear these words of how God watches over us, how God keeps us. As you listen to this psalm, listen for how often we hear the word watch and keep. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. This God says that I am with you and I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to keep you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The second part of that benediction, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. This idea of God's face shining like the sun. And if you think about, well, what does the sun do? Well, the sun reveals. The sun helps us to see. And eventually the sun brings its warmth to, sh to keep us and to hold us. And so the way in which this is described is that as, as the sun extends and its ra rays warm up the earth, so does God extend his love and his mercy. And then it concludes by saying, the Lord lift up his countenance and bring you peace. It's this incredible promise. And, and what I want to do, I want to I track this idea of God's peace. And we're going we're gonna to tear through some scripture here rather quickly. But this is so important when we think about what God's peace looks like and, 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 and how we hear it spoken of. It's talked about early on in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, when, as, this, as this prophecy looks to Jesus. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace, the punishment that Christ took, brought us peace. This is what the blessing is saying. And then we turn over to Luke chapter 2, verse 14. After the birth of Jesus, the angels appear. They speak to the angels. We read this, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. God grants us his peace. He, the birth of Jesus is talked, or the, the arrival of Jesus is talked about in Isaiah 53. Luke chapter 2, we get to hear the arrival of Jesus, the, the, the peace that he brings to us. And then we turn over to John chapter 14, verse 27. And Jesus now speaks words of peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. This peace that was talked about back in Isaiah, this peace that came true in the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 2. And then Jesus says, I'm leaving you with my peace, my wholeness, my completeness. It's that, that word shalom. This is God's blessing. But there's a problem, or perhaps there are several problems, and that is that sometimes we don't see that blessing. Sometimes we don't see the blessings that are right in front of us. And so I want to just spend a little time saying, what? sometimes we get distracted, we get too busy, we miss the blessings that are there. So I want to talk about those that for a few minutes and, and, and help us to think through, what am I missing? I mean, I think about that in my own life, the, the blessings that are right in front of me on a daily basis that I don't see, that I don't always notice. I have an incredible wife who has been so supportive and so encouraging to me in my ministry and in our lives. She's been the true partner for what it is that God has called me to do and for us to do. We have two incredible kids that sometimes I take for granted. These kids who have faith in Jesus, who are, who are trying to figure out how they can best serve the kingdom. I've been blessed with great parents who invested in me and encouraged me and, and, and helped me to become a part, helped me become the person that I am today. I'm blessed by an incredible church. You all are amazing. It's such a great community. So many people that care. 
so many people who reach out and just say, Paul, how are you doing? Let's not miss the blessings that are right in front of us. Let's take time to slow down and remember the ways in which we have been blessed. So sometimes, sometimes we miss our blessings that are right in front of us. The other thing, though, the other thing, though, that I think about sometimes is, is we don't show gratitude until everything kind of works out the way we want it to. It's interesting that the Jewish rabbis taught that you need to say benedictions, you need to say uh, good words when things go well and when things don't go well. And that's a hard lesson to learn. I mean, we love to praise God and give God thanks when things are going our way, but how about when things don't go our way? But the problem is if we only praise God when things go our way, that's, first of all, it's not realistic, but it also raises the bar so high of what it is that we will praise God for. But the rabbi said, no, even in the difficult times, you need to figure out ways to bless and to praise. Because their understanding was this, is that God is always at work. We recall the words of the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where Paul uh, speaks to that. He says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to purpose. We know that in all things God is at work. For those who, have, for those who believe, for those who have faith, Paul doesn't say only in the good things is God at work. He says in all things God is at work. I've been reading a lot of Fleming Rutledge lately, and she's actually, her writing has, has inspired part of what I'm going to be doing for Advent. And she says this about the life of thankfulness. She says, the life of thankfulness, biblically speaking, is lived in view of the hard things of existence. As the life of thanksgiving deepens, we discover that the more mature prayers of thanksgiving are not those offered for the obvious blessings, but those spoken in gratitude for obstacles overcome, for insights gained, for lessons learned, for increased humility, for help received in time of need, for strength to persevere, and for opportunities to serve others. She says there is a maturing that happens as we practice thankfulness, as we seek to bless, because we don't just bless in the good times. Well, the third thing that, that I've been kind of thinking about in, in terms of my own life and, and ways that, that, that I don't bless as much as I should, and, 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 and I call it, th this is what I call it, grumble less, praise more. Complain less, praise more. And, and I was thinking about this, and, and I remember the, the great Broadway show Hamilton. And you may recall there's a scene where Hamilton looks to Aaron Burr because Hamilton wants to get involved in the American Revolution. And he says to Aaron Burr, you know, what, what must I do? And Aaron Burr says very simply, talk less, smile more. And I'm not saying we're going to talk less because in order to bless, we have to speak. But I love that phrase of saying, look, you've you got to learn to smile. I mean, smiling is good for our health. They've, they've proved that, that, that if we just seek to smile, it really does help us. But it's this idea of saying it's so easy to start grumbling. It's so easy to start murmuring. It's so easy to start complaining. And the text that really kind of frightens me around this idea is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. Uh, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, you may recall. He had a lot of struggles with the church at Corinth and, and, and wrote very harshly to them on a number of times. And, and he says, you know, he's, he's writing and hearing about their complaining and their grumbling and, and all this sort of stuff. And, and he reminds them of, of, the, of the people of Israel and the ways in which they tested God and the ways in which they murmured against Moses. And then in verse 10, of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes this, And do not grumble as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. Yikes! Paul's like, you better show gratitude. Because remember what happened back in Israel's day. They were grumbling. They were complaining. They were murmuring. And guess who showed up? The angel of death. Now, I'm not saying angel of death's going to show up if we grumble too much. But it's a warning to us. of saying we've got to be thinking intentionally about figuring out ways that we can praise more and grumble less. Psalm 23 Verse 5, 
David writes this wonderful psalm, and he says this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And what David is describing there is a life of abundant gratitude, a life that has been blessed. He looks at his cup and he, he realizes his head has been anointed. There's food on the table. And he says, and my cup overflows. But here's the problem, and I've, we've talked about this before. Our problem is this. We think our cup's not big enough. We want a bigger cup. Lord, we want more. And we don't simply rest in what we have. Our cup overflows. Out of the abundance of the heart, a person speaks is how Jesus described that. And so we need to say, Lord, let me be content with what I have. Let me see that you are still bringing blessings even though I don't fully get it or fully understand. And here's an important reminder in this text that we just looked at from Numbers chapter 6. Remember where the people were when God instructed Aaron to give this blessing to them. They were in the wilderness. They had left the land of Egypt. They were no longer enslaved. They were headed to the promised land, but they weren't there yet. And they were wandering in the wilderness. And it's in that place that God says, you need my blessing. And what I want to say to us today is, some of us may feel like we're in that wilderness. We know the promise of the promised land. We know the hope of Jesus Christ. We know that we're no longer enslaved. But we feel like we're just wandering around. And God says, in the midst of that, that's when I'm going to bless you. That's when I'm going to make my face to shine upon you. That's when I'm going to allow you to experience peace. And I love that idea that even in the midst of our wandering, that God says, I still have a word of blessing for you. Okay, so I started with Christmas vacation. Let me try and redeem my illustrations. Let's look at Mr. Rogers. Here's what Mr. Rogers said. The real issue in life is not how many blessings we have, but what we do with our blessings. Some people have many blessings and hoard them. Some have few and give everything away. The real issue in life is what we do with our blessings. Let's not hoard them. Let's give them away. So number six, verse 27, and I want to wrap up with this because I think it's, it, it's just such a great image to me. God says, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. They'll put my name on them. You see, you need to understand when the blessing is given, I'm not blessing you. It's God who's blessing you. And it's God who's putting his name on you. He's saying, you belong to me. I am for you. That word of blessing calls, harkens back to, even to our, our baptism where we are brought into the family, where we become a part of God's family. And God is doing the same thing. He's reminding us during the benediction that I'm with you. You belong to me. You are a part of my family. So what does it mean to be blessed? Well, I think it also means that we look for ways to bless others that we look for other people to speak words of hope and encouragement over. That we walk alongside others and say, I am with you and I am for you. Because that's what God has done for us. And so this Thanksgiving week, let, let's seek out ways that we can do that. Let's, it's going to look different, I understand that. But who can we come alongside and bless? Who can we say, I see you, I know you, you are beloved? Because my friends, that's what God has done for us. So let's seek to do that for others. Pray with me, please. God, thank you for your love. Thank you that you have blessed us. Thank you that you keep us. Thank you that your, your face shines upon us. Thank you that we can know your peace. And God, may we receive your blessing today. 
And Lord, may we seek ways that we might bless others. Pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friends, I want to wish you an awesome Thanksgiving week. And I want to end the sermon today by raising my hand and offering you the blessing that God gave to Aaron to give to the priests to bless the nation of Israel. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Drink from the well, Jesus is calling.